So, jetzt müsste man darüber reden. So, now we need to talk about how to tell a population that for two years has been very heavily told through media, leading media control, that we need to defend ourselves against Putin. If we don't stop Putin in Kiev, then he will be in Berlin tomorrow, and then in Munich, and then in Lisbon. Yes. And after all, he is a psychopath. This population would have to be told, no, the West has a shared responsibility. This and that was different, and so on and so forth. The question really is, can this even be done, or do people want to believe that now? I believe we need to talk about this, because there are people, and I am one of them, who perceive totalitarian tendencies in society and in people's thinking. This could be a misperception. I'm not saying that we are in a totalitarianism, but that there are certain tendencies towards, you can't say that, you can't think that, you can't express that. This was extremely strong during Corona, because there was also the connection made with, if not everyone believes the same, then the virus will kill us all. So we had to do it. That was very strong. But then the virus transitioned into this war. During 2021, I thought that perhaps the only thing that could take this all-dominating corona topic out of our minds would probably be a war. Back then, I thought it would probably be a war between the USA and Iran. It turned out differently, but exactly the Ukraine war has more or less mentally taken the place in society that Corona had before, and then Corona was gone. Corona itself was already perceived and discussed in these war terms. To the front, the nurses and so on, the male nurses, the war against the virus and so on. The whole rhetoric was already there. And then it went one-to-one -one against Russia, onto Russia. And we are right in the middle of this flow. And I just had a discussion last week with a Swiss historian who absolutely does not share my analysis. I am among those who take the analysis of John Mearsheimer and so on and say, this is what motivates Russia. And he says, if you explain Russia's position, then you are excusing it. So he refuses to make a distinction between explanation and excuse, which I consider fundamental. So explaining something is not excusing it, as you have also said. And how do you perceive that this narrowing and also this lockstep of society is not only happening in institutions, but also in the minds of people? So thank you for the question. I believe we are now truly getting to the profound root of what is happening in society. And indeed, the first question is, what do we perceive? What are we currently discussing? One, you said, is a totalitarian closure of thought. And then the question is, is that so? How would we justify that? And the second question is, why do others not perceive it? So your friend with whom you discussed, I would classify myself with you. So the transition from Corona to Ukraine. The Belgian psychologist Matthias Desmet would say that one cannot eliminate fear with arguments, but only with an even greater fear. And that's exactly what happened. Fear of the virus, fear of the war, because one cannot counter fear with rational arguments. And that's how both discourses work. So one discourse operates with fear of the virus, that is, corona, and the second discourse operates with fear of Putin. That's why Putin must also be demonized. We now have heaps of books that declare Putin a psychopath and so on, piling up in bookstores. And one really can also ask, what's happening here? Now, my expertise on Eastern Europe is often denied. That was also often said. Yes, Ms. Garrow is not allowed to comment on the Ukraine war, for example, because I do not speak Ukrainian. To that, I can only say, well, Ms. Strack Zimmerman certainly does not speak Ukrainian either and comments on the Ukraine war every day. So that's not a criterion at all. The fact that we've even reached this level of discussion is problematic. But to perhaps make my expertise clear, I was at Sciences Po in the 1980s, between 1986 and 1988. This is a renowned French institute for political science. I studied there under the then-now-deceased Soviet expert Hélène Carrère-Doncos, 
one of the greatest experts on the Soviet Union, in a so-called Diplôme d'études approfondies. As a German in the 1980s, I completed this Diplôme d'études approfondies under Hélène Carrère d'Ancos, who later joined the Académie Française with 16 out of 20 points. That was an exceptionally good diploma. Therefore, it always surprises me when my knowledge of Eastern Europe is now, so to speak, questioned. But let's leave that aside. Interestingly, the course was called Etudes Soviétiques et Est Européennes, so Soviet and Eastern European studies at the time. And you could actually learn a lot there. But to your question, so if we actually lose categories, we are losing categories when we say understanding Putin. Understanding is the most important thing to comprehend a political process, to accompany it, to find political answers. If we now see understanding in a binary way, you understand Putin. So you are a Putin sympathizer, and therefore you want to justify Putin in whatever way, then we are confusing understanding with justifying. Then we verwechseln wir verstehen mit rechtfertigen. Und es ist ein kategorialer Verlust. Wir verlieren unsere Denken. And it is a categorical loss. We are losing our categories of thought. I need to understand something in order to analyze it, evaluate it, and then respond to it. In this respect, the terms that we have almost established in the last three or four years, including denial, corona denial, corona deniers. I have never denied corona or the virus. I only questioned whether the measures we took were intrusive, constituted violations of fundamental rights, and whether they were necessary. Everything today is essentially substantiated. So we have all the data in the world today that prove even Bill Gates admitted, the EMA has admitted, that is the European Medicines Agency, that Corona, Bill Gates said, was not as dangerous, yes, a better flu, but that herd immunity could not be achieved with the vaccine and so on. That means we have all the data we need today to basically say the critics were right, but the categorical loss, the critics of the measures. The categorical loss also lay in the fact that denial was used as a word to basically sweep someone out of the discourse. You deny the virus. No. One only denies the reaction. So one denies nothing. One only analyzes the reaction to the virus. And this categorical loss, I really consider it to be quite concerning. So how we could slip into such a binary good-evil story. Excuse me. In so eine binäre gut böse Geschichte rutschen konnten. Entschuldigung. Nein, das ist, ich, ich gebe Ihnen hier absolut recht. Es gibt no, I absolutely agree with you here. There's just still. Additionally, we are also losing something else at the moment. I can't quite grasp it yet, but for example, this expression just now in English, that it's a talking point, a Putin talking point. Because a talking point in English isn't necessarily a lie, it's not something wrong but can be something absolutely true that someone simply says. So if Putin says, for example, we don't want Ukraine to be militarized because it can be used against us, then in Germany, in Switzerland as well. And so among those people who say, yes, now we must deliver weapons, this argument is then not accepted at all. If we argue, we must ensure that the Russians don't feel threatened, because that would then be a Russian talking point. Something is happening at the moment that really leads to a large number of people feeling that one can only say what is helpful to one's own narrative at the moment. And everything else, even if it's true, is considered inappropriate. Exactly. Talking point, a good example is also whataboutism. So whoever says the illegal Russian war of aggression and its repetition, and then says, why do we talk about America in Iraq as an invasion? So whoever wants to compare, the comparison is the historical argument. Of course, you can't compare apples and oranges. You can also make bad comparisons. Then you can also say, the comparison is flawed. Apples and pears are both fruits. You can compare them as fruits. It simply depends on the context. Exactly. That's what I mean. The comparison is the historical argument. Therefore, the comparison must be made, even if we then realize, okay, the comparison is flawed. But to say that we can no longer make the comparison because it's whataboutism, as if to say, if you now start talking about Iraq, when we're actually talking about the Russian war of aggression, then that's what aboutism. You can't do that either. That means 
we take the comparison, we absolutize things, we lose the categories. We've already seen this with the denial of COVID and the understanding of Putin. I would like to shed some light on how this could happen. There is, as I see it, a very clever French clinical psychologist, Ariane Billeron, who has written many books on how digitalization has contributed to the loss of categories. So how through digitalization, thought structures have actually changed in such a way that this can happen today. Because we are, I don't know, but maybe a generation. There are indeed age-specific differences. What Ariane Bilharen says, for example, is that through swiping, you look at Wikipedia and read something, and then there's a hyperlink and you click on it because you don't understand something. Then you get to another text, and then there's something else. You're actually just digging down. After five hyperlinks, you no longer know what you actually wanted to read. The internet has no page. The internet has no pagination. Das Internet hat keine Paginierung. Das heißt, das Internet hat kein räumliches Wissen. Das heißt, this means that the Internet has no spatial knowledge. That means you can no longer locate your knowledge. You are, so to speak, always swiping down. This leads to if you are not used to anything else. That means you are no longer used to taking a book. A book has a cover here and a cover there, and in between there are pages, and then there is an index, and then you can say on page 126, I find this and that. We have a spatial imagination, most people, when they have read a book, no, oh, it was somewhere in the last third at the bottom. So if you are looking for something in a book, you usually find it because we have a spatial imagination. If that is gone due to this digitization, which Ariane Bilharen says is, you know, targeted infantilization, targeted dumbing down, then we have to realize that we are now, let's call them the millennials. It started around 2000. Blackberry, and then the iPhone, Steve Jobs. Everything with a button, that was kind of the revolution around 2010. Then we now have entire age cohorts, so everyone who is now around 25, who have gone through this swiping and burying themselves, so to speak, who also only read PDFs, and PDFs that are no longer in a context who thus receive a PDF, are supposed to understand and reproduce it. But a PDF is often a contribution from a collected volume, and in a collected volume, there are 10 articles, and one article is different from the others. Ist anders als die anderen, ja? Also mit einem PDF habe ich ja gleich eine Präferenz. So, by using a PDF, I have already given a preference and am no longer saying, here's a collection, it contains so many articles on the topic. Take a look at them all, because these articles together illuminate the issue from various sides. That means all of this would explain, according to Ariane Billeran, that what we are currently analyzing, namely the loss of categories, the blurring of concepts, understanding Putin, understanding is not justifying, and all that. Yes, that these are actually neural mechanisms that ultimately have to do with digitalization. Why? We lose space, as I've already said. We thereby lose the locality and the pagination of knowledge. We lose, as I've said, with the collection, the juxtaposition of various perspectives, a collection with various contributions, and we lose the context. So if you say you have a point, and then there is always a history and always a future. And we basically know that whoever does not know the past cannot find their place in the present and cannot shape the future. So you need the tripartite structure. Where do I come from? Where am I? Where do I want to go? If you take that away because you are only on the point, digging down, then you lose the context, thereby the history, thereby the comparison. You lose the categories, you lose the space, and you can no longer shape the future. Und sie können Zukunft nicht mehr gestalten. Ich halte das epistemisch für einen, für einen, einen ganz I consider this epistemically to be a very dangerous development, which in my eyes we unfortunately have not yet sufficiently addressed. Although I was in Paris recently, there was an interesting conference on ChatGPT where exactly this was discussed. But let's stick to the point. The events we are now observing, for example, the illegal Russian war of aggression on February 22nd, 2022, as it is told, is exactly that. There was nothing before. There was no civil war before. There was no Maidan. There was not this. There was not that. We also do not consider how we as Europe can get out of this. What are good solutions for Europe? Do we need Eurasia? Do we want a security architecture with Russia? Instead, we only discuss the point of illegal wars of aggression and so on. 
And from this comes a political paradigm. Putin must not win. This is what happens when we lack the contextualization of history and the possibility of envisioning the future. Then we stand at this point, and that is totalitarian. So you asked, how do we deal with this totalitarianism? And I just wanted to describe the process that makes it so totalitarian, because we essentially stand still at this point. And then Adorno applies, because what is, is not everything because what is can change. What is, is not everything. But if we always stay at this point, then we can't get out of it. It's quite interesting. I always wonder where that comes from, because we are in a dependency relationship with society. Society shapes us, and we shape society in return. So we have this feedback effect, and what we are observing at the moment, what I assume, is that we are observing a tendency towards what I call war logic. And war logic can not only affect war, but also other domains. And the phenomenon is always that when you suddenly have an enemy, this way of thinking starts to really become aggressive towards people's logic, meaning that certain areas of thought must be switched off. So for example, the historicization of a conflict, or also the differentiation, saying that we now need to look at this from various perspectives. Because if an enemy exists, and if the friend-foe thinking starts, then everything must be reduced to a relatively simple scheme. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the situation of having an enemy. So, we have this, and especially with this question from the beginning, there is this wonderful word in German, Diskurshoheit and Deutungshoheit, meaning that there really are certain groups that are very good at setting this interpretative authority for everyone else. And that's where the conversation starts, either in February 2022 for the war in Ukraine or on October 7th for Palestine. Yes, exactly. That's what I wanted to say too. Exactly, that's what I wanted to say too. So this is very analog. October 7th, before that, the world was different. And on October 7th, everything started. And from that moment on, it is analyzed. And then there is only this one political solution. And then, so to speak, we lack the past, the buildup, the backstory, which is actually relevant. Yes, so of course it is relevant to recount what happened in the days before and so on. So, or even in the years before Maidan and so on, because this discussion is centrally about Ukraine. Russia, for example, about this NATO eastward expansion, the promise. This is being discussed everywhere. So about the so-called co-responsibility of the West. And if you don't assert that, then you can't actually achieve peace. So if you work into polarization, and we have worked into polarization when you mentioned that, the friend-foe scheme, good evil. I believe her name was Maria Bonelli or something, this Belgian historian who around the year 2000 wrote a book about war propaganda. And the 10 mechanisms of war propaganda, you can find that on the internet. We also quoted it in the Endgame book. It's quite clear, we are the good ones. The attacker is the enemy. The attacker slaughters and murders and so on. We only defend, so we never do anything bad. So the categories in which the discussion is held are very relevant. And one can really look at the Ukraine-Russia situation. You can almost see these mechanisms of war propaganda one-to-one, -one, how one-dimensional the discussion already is. The best example is now this wiretapping scandal. So that's one thing, the one-dimensionality. We only defend the attacker is the only evil. So clearly, friend, foe, not about responsibility. I say this because I really don't want to use a trivial example, but I am a mother of two sons, and if they ever argued over a Lego brick while playing with Legos, well, then there's only one thing left to do, separate the two brawlers. That's actually what Bertha von Suttner did, lay down the arms. For that, she even received the Nobel Prize in 1905. And then you usually have two sons. One always says, but he started it, he started it, he started it. That's the mechanism of war propaganda. But he started it, and because he started it, now I'm allowed to as well. And at the end of the day, we had the Pope, who said white flag, separate the brawlers. What else is a Pope supposed to say? And we see that even the Pope was treated disrespectfully because he was for peace. 
and said separate the brawlers. How many more people have to die? gesagt hat, die Streithähne auseinander, wie viele Menschen sollen noch sterben, ja? Und es ist natürlich eine Verwahrlosung, glaube ich. Yes, and of course it's a neglect, I believe, of our thinking and ultimately of our press, that we, so to speak, ostracize the one who first wants to separate the fighters, to use an analogy from my sons playing with Lego, that this person is now being shunned. For example, yesterday I saw Karin Mioska in this new talk show format on ARD. It was about this statement by Mützenich, the war. We should be able to think about not just winning the war with more weapons, but also perhaps about freezing it. This is in itself initially a completely innocent statement or suggestion to say, can we think about freezing, taking a break, stopping the slaughter? The whole show yesterday on ARD was actually just about how Karin Mioska, as a significant German journalist, was pressuring Lars Klingbeil, who is, what is he, the managing director or parliamentary group leader of the SPD, into a corner that the statement by Mützenich, the question, the question of whether we can freeze the war, is completely unacceptable. That means, in my eyes, in my perception, this show had a complete bias a complete direction, a discourse dominance, which stated that the Mützenich statement must not exist, because freezing the war actually means accepting territorial gains by the Russians and so on. And that shows us, I think, how much our thinking has already been distorted. I'll give another example. We had this eavesdropping scandal involving those who were eavesdropped on the generals who were talking. And the focus of the Spiegel headline thus diverted to the incident, not the content. This is a bit of what I just mentioned, form and function. The Spiegel was only concerned with how the Russians could log into this webinar thing. How did they get the access data? Instead of asking, what did German generals say there, they said, we have to somehow see to it that we blow up these bridges in Ukraine and make it look as much as possible as if it couldn't be traced back to Germany. That's a, a crazy statement. And we should have reacted with an outcry in the population, in my eyes, that German generals discuss such things against the backdrop of our history, against the backdrop of the chancellor's promise, and so on. Instead, the outcry was about how the Russians could, where was the leak? How could the Russians log in? Yes. That means we have, I call them distraction discourses. So we divert from the actual issue and move on to some minor battlefield, which is then discussed. I find that very interesting. I have the feeling that this is also a deliberate distraction, because if one were to engage in the discussion, then one would have to deal with the problem that one's own thinking and worldview might not reflect what is currently happening. And that would hurt many people intellectually. That's why there are certain things that cannot be discussed. Although they, you and I, we can talk about them, but they are not picked up by the media. Nord Stream, or the fact that your chancellor stood next to Mr. Biden when he said, if Russia attacks, then Nord Stream is finished. These are all things that should actually cause a huge outcry, definitely from, I assume, our perspective. But then they don't. Because also the people who should be alarmed by this probably don't want to be. I also often notice in discourse that certain arguments or certain facts of what has happened in the past or even currently are simply not addressed. They are left out, and then one must return again to October 7th or February 24th and to the illegality. And then this argument repeats itself, that we are allowed to because the other is evil. So here I am intellectually constrained, from the highest academic positions, down to every roofer and so on. There the thinking then works the same again. So thank you for the question. I really think that's the most important thing you said at the beginning of your question. Then we would have to admit that we might see things wrongly or believe things wrongly or that we follow certain things. I don't remember exactly how you phrased it. Worldview. 
Das ist ja das Worldview. We would have to change our worldview. That's really the worst thing. I don't know if it was Nietzsche who said the worst thing is to take away people's beliefs. It doesn't matter whether it's socialism or Christianity, whatever it is. But if you take away what people have believed in until now, then most people... So in a way, that which has carried them and their lives. Let me give a completely different example to make it clear. I knew a woman who worked for the NVA when the GDR collapsed in November 1989. And if you were with the NVA and you have built a life for 30 years, believing in the great GDR, and for this woman everything was fine, she had two children, she had a salary, it was secure, she had a stable life, For her, literally, a world collapsed on the day when she first realized that others looked at the GDR differently and that others saw the GDR as a state of injustice. Now imagine this woman who has to rethink 30 years of her life. What have I lived in? Why didn't I see it? Worin habe ich denn gelebt? Warum habe ich das nicht gesehen? Und jetzt stellen Sie sich vor, wir als Westen, der sogenannte Westen. And now imagine we as the West, the so-called West, we would now have to, to quote Mearsheimer, and there are many others, yes, Kennan also wrote it in 2004. So actually, the library is full of books that one could read to say maybe it was all different. The preparations for the Ukraine war, the American interest behind it, Brzezinski, so it is really explained in detail and firmly there. We could read all this and perceive it, and if we did, then we would have many arguments to say, wait a minute, the story that is being told is not the story that is unfolding. There are other arguments, other facts also regarding Putin. So you just mentioned the pipeline, but one could also mention these peace negotiations in April 2022, which are now It's documented now. By the Ukrainians, yes. Exactly. Which is why General Kujat says, in essence, the West should admit that from April 2022, so the peace negotiations were boycotted by us. So Boris Johnson, the West is not yet ready for peace, were boycotted by us. Actually, General Kujat recently said in a service TV broadcast, from April 2022, the West is responsible for the prolongation of the war. Yes. Now we would have to talk about how do we tell a population to whom for two years, very massively through media, leading media control, it has been said we have to defend ourselves against Putin. If we don't stop Putin in Kiev, then he is tomorrow in Berlin, and then in Munich, and then in Lisbon. Yeah. And after all, a psychopath is like that. This population should be told, no, the West has a shared responsibility this and that was different, and so on and so forth. The question really is whether this can be done at all or whether people now want to believe that. Just to make a footnote, I am not objecting to the fact that we have human rights violations and also electoral rights violations in Russia. There were just elections, so let's make that clear. I am analyzing here, I'm not defending Putin, I do not like Putin. Yes, so he is of course a strategist who leads a war, however. We need to analyze this with a very sober vocabulary of interests. But this is by no means about glossing over Russia as an optimal democracy. By no means is it about defending Putin, to make that clear. But to analyze what we have just said, Kissinger, Kennan, neutrality, Minsk agreements, NATO's eastward expansion, thus making visible the West's shared responsibility, only that could eventually lead us to a negotiating position. Basically, a bit like with Christianity, we point at someone with one finger and three fingers point back. So that's why in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So, to get to the point where a conflict has built up in which both sides have a shared responsibility is indeed the only way to peace. But of course, we can't get there at the moment, because in my eyes, we have public spheres that are concreted, which are really cognitively cemented, fitting exactly into this polarization of friend-foe schema, good-evil. And because it is so, there is unfortunately also somehow the feeling that we can't get out of this track. So we can't get out of the good evil. Putin absolutely must not win track. It's like a car in desert sand. If you keep giving more gas, then you drive this car further into the desert sand instead of not freezing, at least saying, can we turn off the engine? 
And that is, of course, really dangerous, but it shows, and that's the worst thing. It shows the epistemic break we have with our own thinking past. So that we are no longer able to think along with the other, like Olaf Palme or Willy Brandt or Egon Barr or Kreisky, to bring the other argument into the debate. And if that were the case, then then it's unfortunately a problematic situation. I believe, like you, that at the moment it's about the West, so to speak. As you said, the hardest thing is telling the population not everything you believe is true. And the terrible thing is that in such a moment, arguments don't help anymore. Maybe I may add this sentence. You talked about the pipeline and so on. What we are doing is on a large-scale denial of reality. So denial of reality. Also Realitätsverweigerung, ja. Ich zitiere mal den, den, ähm, den äh, auch Bonn. I'll quote the Bonn philosopher Marcus Gabriel. He wrote a significant book on fiction and reality. And in several books, he analyzes that we are currently facing a problem where in the age of deconstructionism, everything is being merged together. Man and woman are now queer. Yes, so we are losing these concepts, that we are also merging reality and fiction. That is, fiction becomes reality and reality becomes fiction, something like that. So there is the same mechanism. And against this background, I really have the impression that we in the West are in a state of denial about what Mearsheimer and realism are, what reality is, which we no longer want to illuminate from various sides in order to lull ourselves into a fiction that we then declare to be reality. This is a highly problematic mechanism that has a lot to do with how our media operates, which can, of course, be controlled. So look at what's it called, the Togol, who wrote this book, Psychological Warfare, which, of course, points out that this perception of reality is naturally a control of algorithms. So what we perceive at all is naturally controlled. And against this background, I actually believe that a totalitarianism of thought is the process we are in, and one can only hope that we can expand beyond this. I have hope that in the end there will be a de-escalation controlled from above, if it is desired, by Paris, Berlin, London, and maybe also Washington, and then bit by bit that we move away from this mindset. The other possibility is sheer fear. If a major nuclear war is actually imminent, then fear might lead us to not go as far as we would like to in our thinking. Ms. Garo, we have already exceeded an hour, and I would like to thank you very much for your time and hope that we can talk again in the future, especially about how things will proceed with your plagiarism accusations. I wish you all the best and hope you get through this well and that we can find our way out of this totalitarianism of thought together. Yes, so I thank you for this conversation. It was really very, very nice. Yes, also the paths that we have rolled out. I think there is, how do you say, a lot of room for research. I hope that many of the questions that we have raised here might somehow arouse interest. Maybe we should almost develop a research program for it, because it is, I believe, the most important contemporary question that we reconsider our own thought structures. I agree. Mrs. Garo, thank you very much. Thank you. Greetings to Japan.